Who are a few of the most despicable criminals who will do anything for money? Let's find out, starting with... Number 7. The Puppy Mill A mother and her two daughters made $150,000 from an illegal puppy farm they ran during lockdown. Julie Pierce and her daughters, Rosalie and Kaylee, sold puppies online during the pandemic when there was a boom in demand for pets. Although Julie was the mastermind of the business, she moved from Wales to Spain and left her daughters in charge of the day-to-day -day operations. An ad for a Shih Tzu puppy claimed it was raised in a loving home and that the puppy's mother was the family pet. Unfortunately, none of the puppies lived in loving conditions. Despite receiving up to $3,000 a puppy, the women kept dozens of dogs confined in filthy rooms and didn't provide enough food or water. Police officers and animal rescue workers raided the home and saved over 50 dogs. Many of the animals were sadly malnourished and underweight. The three women admitted to running an unlicensed dog breeding business and engaging in unfair commercial practices. Rosalie and Kaylee also confessed to causing unnecessary suffering to a protected animal and failing to meet its welfare needs. Rosalie and Kaylee received 56 week suspended sentences and were ordered to complete 100 hours of community service. Julie received a 42 week prison sentence suspended for 12 months. Number six, the rogue banker. Banker Fabian Gaglio ran a Ponzi scheme, stealing roughly $100 million from his clients. Unlike other criminals, Gaglio had no qualms about coming forward. He visited a Parisian police precinct with a folder of notes and confessed to his crimes. Gaglio explained that people turned to him to help make their money grow. He managed money for rich people worldwide, including Italian artists, American entrepreneurs, and rich families in Singapore. As one of two principals at Hottinger & Partners, a Swiss wealth manager, Gaglio lured his clients with the promise of high returns and low taxes. When the investments went poorly, Gaglio resorted to taking money from one client to pay another Ponzi style. His operation evolved into him creating fake statements and forging signatures. The weird thing, though, was that none of his victims were French, and authorities didn't understand why he confessed in France. When they asked, Gaglio claimed some of the forged documents happened in the country. But the real reason he turned himself in in France, rather than in Spain or Switzerland, was that France rarely allows the extradition of its citizens. Gaglio entered the police station at 9 a.m., and by 4.20 p.m., he signed his statement and walked free. During his interview, Gaglio admitted that he had nothing left from the 15-year scam. His clients' money paid for his lavish vacations, private jets, and paintings by Keith Haring and Andy Warhol. Gaglio's business partner, French Count Jean-Francois de Clermont-Tonnerre, tearfully told Hottinger and Partners clients the truth. The firm and 11 of its clients filed criminal and civil complaints against Gaglio in Switzerland. Victims and investigators in other countries also learned of Gaglio's operation. Luxembourg was the quickest to act, charging him a few months later with fabricating and using forged bank documents, fraud, and laundering stolen funds. He received a five-year jail sentence and the court ordered that he pay back $177,000 of the money he took, believing it was all he could afford. Gaglio appealed the verdict and after spending a year in prison in Luxembourg, he was temporarily released and his sentence was cut down to four years. It's customary in the small European country for people to serve half of their sentence on parole, meaning he only had a year left in jail. Gaglio's victims had lost millions of dollars to his scam and were unhappy with his punishment. They feared that the interest in pursuing the case would dwindle with Hottinger out of business and Gaglio serving time. Investigators discovered the scope of Gaglio's history as a con artist. In his early years, he laundered around $300 million through the offshore financial system for businessmen, politicians, and criminals. Gaglio's money laundering connections were vast, with enterprises in Italy, California, the French Riviera, and Russia. Even years after his confession, Gaglio's victims have never stopped campaigning to force authorities across Europe to take action. They filed new lawsuits and contacted private investigators to recover their lost funds. Still, when Gaglio left jail, he returned to his $10,000 a month luxurious villa. Number 5. The Gambler 
Caregiver Laura Hancock scammed thousands of dollars from vulnerable patients to fund her gambling addiction. Hancock was the service manager for Seeds Care, a facility dedicated to helping adults suffering from mental health conditions and learning disabilities. She used her position to convince victims they needed to give her money to pay rent for their stay at the facility. Hancock even took one of her victims to an ATM to withdraw around $5,000 for his rent payment, which he later learned that he didn't have to pay. She also manipulated other staff members members into taking residents to ATMs and delivering envelopes filled with cash to her desk. The thefts occurred between March 2020 and September 2021 and ended when an employee raised concerns about Hancock charging rent to patients. Other workers also reported that savings tins were going missing because Hancock had been stealing those too. When Hancock was eventually confronted about her scam, she immediately confessed to her employers. The organization feared it would have to shut down and decided to reimburse all of Hancock's victims. Hancock blamed her thefts on her gambling addiction, which started when she was 16. She said she tried hypnotherapy and cognitive behavioral therapy to deal with her addiction, but nothing worked and she became desperate for money. But the judge disagreed with Hancock, painting herself as a victim since she was targeting such vulnerable individuals. Hancock ended up with a two-year suspended sentence and was ordered to complete 250 hours of community service and 20 days of rehabilitation for gambling. Number four, the inheritance. Ex-Royal Navy officer Ian Shepard scammed his young stepson out of his inheritance. The former lieutenant commander swindled the money from Joshua Powell, who was 10 years old and had learning difficulties. Joshua received $105,000 from his father, Stephen Powell, who had passed away. Stephen and Shepard were good friends in the Navy, and though the details aren't totally clear, Shepard ended up marrying Powell's wife and took charge of Joshua's inheritance, despite being bankrupt. He set up a secret account in his wife Mary's name. Shepard faked her signature and used the account to siphon off cash. He made a large number of transfers, ranging from hundreds of dollars to thousands of dollars into overseas accounts in Italy. Mary grew suspicious of her husband, though she never really said what happened that made her suspicious. But however it happened, she uncovered Shepard's operation and reported him to the police, speculating that he owed her son about $80,000. Joshua had planned to use his late father's money to pay for college, fund his medication, and fund construction projects at his mother's home. Shepard pleaded guilty to fraud and one count of failing to surrender on two separate occasions. He was sentenced four years in jail. Number three, the golden investor. Millionaire New York investor Sean Golden swindled millions of dollars from his clients as part of a securities and loan fraud scheme. He stole almost $7 million from at least 35 victims, mainly targeting school teachers and people reaching retirement. As the owner of Golden Wealth Management Inc., Golden transferred his clients' investment funds into his personal accounts. He used the money to buy plots of land, a chalet, and to pay high tax bills. Golden falsified documents to take out loans to build on each plot and soon had multiple mansions worth millions of dollars each. Golden's primary home in Connecticut had a pool, game room, a wine cellar, and sat on 25 acres of land. His six-bedroom property in Bridgehampton, New York, had large surrounding gardens, a swimming pool, seven bathrooms, and a luxury game room. His Wilmington, Vermont property featured six bedrooms and bathrooms, open-plan interiors with a cozy stone fireplace, and stunning views of the surrounding scenery. When Golden's victims made withdrawal requests, he lied and said their money was gone due to financial difficulties. Many people lost their entire life savings and couldn't afford medical care or contribute to their grandchildren's college expenses. Golden pleaded guilty to six felony charges, including second and third degree grand larceny, falsifying business records, and first degree scheme to defraud. He was sentenced to three years in the big house. Number two, the worst doppelganger. Lois Ann Reese had enough of her husband, David Reese, so she got rid of him forever by putting him six feet deep. Then she did the same thing to another woman and stole her identity. In March 2018, David's business partners called for a welfare check after they hadn't seen him for two weeks. When the police arrived at the couple's home, they discovered he had passed because of his chest wounds. Lois and David's Cadillac Escalade was also nowhere to be seen, and $11,000 was missing from David's business account. Authorities later traced Lois, nicknamed Losing Streak Lois because of her gambling habit, to an Iowa casino, but she was long gone by the time they arrived. 
Lois headed to Florida and ditched her late husband's car at a park near Fort Myers Beach. It was there that the police found Pamela Sellers Hutchison's body in her apartment. The woman, who resembled Lois's appearance, was executed by the same firearm used on David. Security camera footage showed Lois leaving the apartment complex and driving away in Pamela's vehicle on that fateful night. Lois also stole Pamela's ID and credit cards. Lois left Florida and drove 1,300 miles to Louisiana and Texas. She went on the run for a while until law enforcement located her at South Padre Island in Texas. The police believe she was planning the same repeat crime in Texas, having befriended another woman named Bernadette. Bernadette thought she and Lois were new best friends, with Lois seeming kind and genuine. The two women went out to dinner, and afterward, Bernadette invited Lois to her building's community hot tub and invited her to stay in her guest room. One of the bartenders that served Bernadette that night was concerned that she seemed intoxicated after a few drinks. Bernadette also couldn't remember why she invited Lois to come home with her to begin with. A few days later, the women planned to meet up again for dinner. While Bernadette waited for Lois, someone at the restaurant told her that her new best friend had been arrested. Authorities searched the car Lois drove and found a prescription bottle, stained sheets and blankets, and the packaging of a new cell phone. They found two firearms, bullets, duct tape, rubber gloves, a holster, and stolen credit cards in her hotel room. The shell castings from the scene of David's case matched up with those found in the hotel room. Lois was extradited to Florida and went to trial. Afterwards, Lois returned to Minnesota to stand trial for her husband's crimes. Lois initially had planned to plead not guilty, but she eventually changed her mind when decided to plead guilty to all charges. At the time of this video, Lois is serving two life sentences. She said the real punishment is living the rest of your life without her husband. Hey, if you're enjoying this video, be sure to stay right here for our past release in some of the worst people who took advantage of pandemic assistance. Number 1. The Heartless Gang Scammers posed as law enforcement officials to swindle roughly $150,000 from World War II veteran Kenneth Whitaker. They told Whitaker that criminals had attempted to steal from his bank account and he needed to transfer money for safekeeping. The criminal operation had eight con artists who contacted people in their 70s, 80s, and 90s. Victims received phone calls from people they thought worked for the bank. The scammers made their victims believe their money was in danger and claimed criminals had tried to access their accounts. Gang members then scheduled a courier to come to the victim's houses to collect and safeguard the money. Victims believed the couriers were law enforcement officials and handed over the cash. Whitaker believed he was helping the police catch criminals and cooperated with the scammers. The gang targeted at least 140 people before London's Metropolitan's Counter-Terrorism Command noticed cash being funneled from the UK to Syria. Investigators tracked down the fraudsters, including Magzumi Abukar, the key player in the operation. After stealing roughly $1.25 million, nine scammers were found guilty of fraud and money laundering offenses and were sentenced to a combined 35 years in jail. Here are a few people who completely took advantage of the pandemic. Number four, a family affair. Three days after Congress approved the $2.2 trillion economic relief package during the pandemic in March 2020, Richard Avizan and his wife Marietta Terabellian applied for a $112,000 loan using the aliases Lulia Zadko and Victoria Couchko. The first loan was filed for top quality contracting. One day later, Thadko and Couchco requested a $150,000 loan for journeyman construction. Since the government was in a hurry to provide economic relief, the loans were approved almost immediately. The huge federal loan deposits put sparkles in the couple's eyes. They spent the free money almost as fast as it poured in. Meanwhile, they kept filing loan applications using sham companies. By August 2020, they applied for 151 loans totaling more than $18 million in pandemic relief funds. They invested $640,000 of the money in a Mediterranean-style hillside villa in Tarzana, California, with a view of the valley. They bought gold coins, diamond earrings, wristwatches, and more. One of Avezian's most luxurious purchases was a $35,000 Rolex he bought while on vacation with his wife in Turks and Caicos. They also had $450,000 in cash stuffed in grocery bags littered across their property. 
They went on fancy tropical vacations and bought more high-end items for themselves. The FBI started trailing Abzian and Terabellion after noticing suspicious amounts of money entering their accounts. For months, authorities searched their trash and bank records until they had enough evidence for a case. The couple was on their way home from a Caribbean beach vacation when they were flagged by customs during a layover in Miami. Customs agents led them away to search their luggage and phones. They discovered the couple was carrying credit cards in the names of their aliases, Lulia Zadko and Victoria Couchko, the same names they used to fill out millions of dollars in loan applications. It seemed Avizian and Terabellion were operating a family fraud ring that hadn't properly covered its tracks. After hours of questioning, Avzian and Terabellion were arrested and held in jail for the night. But two weeks later, FBI agents and a SWAT team showed up at the family's Tarzana's estate in the early morning and raided the couple's 2.6-acre property. Terabellion, who was out on bail at the time, ran out the back door and tossed a grocery bag into the bushes. Agents located the grocery bag and emptied it, finding almost half a million in cash. The kids and the family dog emerged from the house and stood on the pool deck as authorities ransacked the home looking for evidence. On June 25, 2021, a Los Angeles federal court convicted Abzian, Terabellion, and two relatives of conspiracy to commit bank fraud, conspiracy to launder money, and other crimes. Four accomplices also pleaded guilty. In total, the FBI arrested eight different people involved with the scam. The jury decided that the government could confiscate the house, jewelry, gold, and all other items purchased with the pandemic relief money that should have been used to save American businesses and careers. The criminal case became a family scandal when Avzian's younger brother, Archer, took the witness stand and blamed most of the scam on his wife, Tamara Dadian. The already strained marriage between Archer and Dadian worsened when they blamed each other for the family fraud ring. Archer insisted that Dadian committed all of the crimes on her side of the house while he ran his trucking business outside of the home. When asked about the photos of fake IDs on his phone, he blamed his wife again. He said she never showed him any of the government loan applications she filed. But when loan deposits were made to his bank account, he had no problem spending them. He received $285,000 in pandemic relief funds and admitted to using some of it to buy supplies and repairs for his trucking company. He also bought a $24,000 Harley Davidson motorcycle. He invested $93,000 of it in an escrow company to help his brother purchase their Tarzana Hillside estate. After sentencing in June 2021, Dadian was supposed to report to prison in January 2022 to serve a 10-year prison sentence. But she never arrived. By February 2022, she was declared a fugitive and fled to Europe. Her whereabouts were unknown, and the FBI offered a $20,000 reward for any tips related to her disappearance. Dadian convinced her brother-in-law, Richard Avzian, and his wife, Terabellion, to go on the run with her. Federal employees believe the three of them cut off their ankle monitor bracelets after their convictions in June. Authorities finally found them in February 2022 in Montenegro. Spanish officials deported them to the U.S. shortly after. Richard Avzian was sentenced to 17 years in prison, and Terabellion was sentenced to six. Archer Avzian, Richard's brother and Dadian's estranged husband, was sentenced to five years behind bars. Dadian was sentenced to 10 years and 10 months. Number three, Scammer on Fire. Our story begins in the black summer when massive bushfires tore through Australia between 2019 and 2020. As of October 2020, the fires had burnt up to 84 million acres of land and 5,900 buildings, including 2,779 homes. Sadly, the fires also claimed 24 lives. The blaze also affected 3 billion creatures, mostly reptiles. Some species were driven to extinction, while air quality dropped to hazardous levels. An estimated $103 billion was needed to recover property and economic losses. Millions of Australian lives were affected and the economy suffered endlessly. This only got worse when COVID-19 struck the continent. On January 6, 2020, the federal government allocated $2 billion for brush fire recovery. The money was divided between primary producers, mental health providers, local governments, charities, financial counselors, young people, and other forms of emergency funding to help get Australian citizens back on their feet. But sometimes, the money didn't end up in the right hands. That's where Ellen Howard comes in. Howard, an unemployed woman in her 30s, applied for relief payments in the states of New South Wales and Victoria, even though she didn't live in either state. She scammed the New South Wales local government by claiming her house burnt down in the bushfires. 
She forged fake identity documents to prove she lived there and hoped to get her hands on a $10,000 emergency payment. Though Howard's home was damaged from fire, it wasn't from the bushfires. Instead, a domestic dispute between her and an ex-partner led to an accidental fire in the house. Still, she successfully secured the $10,000 payment and then received $93,000 more in subsidies, taking money away from the people who really needed it. Howard's greedy ways escalated when she saw new opportunities for scamming the government during the pandemic. When the Australian state of Victoria went into lockdown during COVID-19, Howard claimed her career was negatively affected, even though she was already unemployed. Howard didn't even live in Victoria. She applied for $450 support payments, 13 times stealing identity documents from family, friends, and total strangers. As a result, some individuals and businesses couldn't make their claims or receive relief money because the government thought those payments had already been sent out. Howard successfully obtained $104,000 and tried to secure $258,000 more in government and charity disaster relief funding. Howard thought the money was simply there for the taking and received the deposits easily after submitting fraudulent applications. And with that money, she went on shopping sprees, such as buying a new wallet from Louis Vuitton and posting it on Facebook. In all, Howard used multiple bank accounts and email addresses to apply for 34 relief payments. Like all of the other scams, the government finally caught up with her. In November 2020, Howard was arrested and refused bail on 16 charges of dishonestly obtaining financial benefit by deception. Police found a ledger full of email addresses used to file fraudulent loan applicants on her when she was arrested. The prosecutor said Howard was in a world of trouble. She failed to show up to court several times and multiple warrants were issued for her arrest. The legal aid lawyer proposed very strict bail conditions, which were denied to add more restrictions to her internet use. She pleaded guilty to 11 counts of fraudulently claiming bushfire payments in New South Wales and 13 counts of fraudulently claiming lockdown payments in Victoria. She admitted to 16 dishonesty charges that amounted to $250,000 in funds from the Tasmanian government and charities. Number two, unvaccinated. Two New York nurses took advantage of their role in the pandemic and made more than one and a half million dollars in crafting fake vaccination cards. They obtained real vaccine doses, CDC vaccination cards, and syringes from the New York State Department of Health. However, they skipped the first part of the process, you know, the uh, vaccination part, and went right to the cards. Marissa Araro wrote out the fake CDC cards and her boss, Julie Devuano, input the fake information into the New York State Health Department database. Devuano was a nurse practitioner who owned Wild Child Pediatric Healthcare in Amityville, Long Island, where Araro worked as a nurse. Two nurses teamed up to sell fake adult vaccination cards for $220 each and children's cards for $85 each. Then they entered the information into the New York Health System's website, so it was on record that these patients received the vaccine even though they didn't. The women made over $1.5 million in profits from the scheme. This equates to roughly 6,800 adult vaccination cards or 17,000 pediatric cards. Since they ran a pediatric facility, they probably handed out the cards to entire families. Let's say a family equals two adults and two kids. That means they handed out fake vaccine cards to about 2,400 families, charging $610 per family. With all these fake cards floating around Long Island, someone probably showed off or talked about what the nurses at Wild Child Pediatric were doing. Not only that, but local businesses noticed an odd number of patients entering Wild Child Pediatric and reported their suspicions to the police. Devuano and Araro's criminal activity was uncovered when they wrote out a fake vaccination card for an undercover detective who never received the jab. Then, police obtained a search warrant for Devuano's home. They discovered nearly $1 million in cash and a ledger showing almost $1.5 million in profits when they entered. The nursing duo apparently ran the scheme since November 2021. They were arrested in January 2022, pleaded not guilty, and released without bail. A third accomplice was receptionist Brooke Hogan, who also was arrested for her help in conducting the fake vaccination card scam. She was charged with felony forgery as well. Plot twist. Devuano's husband is an NYPD officer being investigated for potentially helping his wife fly under the radar and even referring potential customers to her. The Suffolk County District Attorney publicly shamed the nurses for using their jobs to endanger public health even though they were supposed to be protecting it. And for what? 
to make a buck. Ferraro's attorney asked the public to consider his client's career and all of her contributions to healthcare before this scandal. Number one, the mayor's daughter. When the U.S. government announced the PPP program, Damara Holness decided she wanted a piece of the pie. Tamara, the former mayor of Broward County, Florida's daughter, at the time she owned Holness Consulting Inc., a political consulting firm operating out of South Florida. However, the firm was inactive and had been since 2018. Then, when the government announced the PPP program, Holness Consulting suddenly appeared back on the map. In her online application, Holness said her company employed 18 people and paid out $120,000 in payroll each month during 2019, a year when the business was not operational. In return, Holness got a juicy check for $300,000. All it took were a few fraudulent payroll tax forms and a frantic federal government. However, Holness knew she had to clean the money. So, in a sewed money laundering scheme, she paid 22 different people $1,300 every two weeks. They'd cash their checks, pocket $300, and give Holness the other $1,000. The U.S. was ripe with COVID relief fraud. It wasn't long before the COVID-19 Fraud Enforcement Task Force caught up to her. Her lawyer called it an act of desperation rather than greed, saying most of the money went toward taxes and housing arrangements. Still, it didn't change the fact that she lied on her application and swindled money away from businesses that needed it. In the end, a judge sentenced Holness to 20 months in jail and ordered her to pay back the $300,000 she stole. Click to watch one of these next videos. Let us know in the comment section whether or not you think there should be higher penalties for scamming senior citizens.